Well, folks, it's that time once again where we reach out out of the blue with another book review. This one may cause some controversy. Dr. Frank Luntz, words that work, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. So let's jump right in. All right, so Dr. Frank Luntz obviously has a reputation, and depending on what side of the aisle you're on, that reputation is either great or truly, truly horrible. There's a lot of baggage that comes with a name like this, but I wanted to give this particular book a chance because I wanted to expand my own knowledge of what's going on in the process. I'm a general fan of words. I'm a general fan of language. I'm always interested in learning about the craft of speaking and writing better. So this book was a natural fit. Obviously, it's been endorsed by Tony Robbins, who calls it a must read. So there's a lot of people who have stood by the work of Dr. Frank Luntz. Now, here's where things get interesting. He's been a top Republican strategist. He's behind a lot of the euphemisms that people like George Carlin hated so much and fought so hard against. He's the guy who suggested that instead of calling it the estate tax or the inheritance tax, we call it the death tax. His entire career was as a pollster, or if you're Ross Perot, as a researcher, where he would poll thousands or possibly even millions of Americans and ask them their opinions on various words, trying to find language that resonates or doesn't resonate with the American people. So this book is a detailed profile of the general American psyche as it exists. What do typical Americans believe, think, feel? How do they see issues? what words resonate with them and what words don't. And oftentimes it's a little tiny play on language. Like for example, many Americans are against the idea of denying illegal immigrants healthcare. Now, very few of them are against the idea of not giving them coverage, if that makes sense. So this book is full of little twists. We don't like denying people, but it feels somehow better to not give them something, even though it means the exact same thing. So this book is full of what you might call euphemisms or alternatives, how to avoid negative language. Some of the interesting things he talks about is how Americans generally want people to be aspirational. They don't like negativity in their politics or their leaders. They want something that they can look up to. And if they see a politician being overly negative, it's a turnoff generally for Americans. Americans have a can-do spirit, a practical spirit. We like positivity, hard work, all of those things. That's the positive side. So if you're looking for a practical way to give a better message that's going to appeal to a large part of Americans, then this book is something that you must read. And it's also been adopted by a lot of corporations. Now, this book also feels very dated. Some of the words that work are words like innovative and, you know, things that sound like uh, rehashed corporate buzzwords that have been used and overused ad infinitum for the last 10 years since it was written certain words that, that, that just keep coming up over and over again. He has entire sections about words to avoid and words that you should use in, in their place. So don't call it a tax reform, call it tax simplification. Don't call it privatization, call it personalization, those kinds of things. Uh, don't call it capitalism, call it the free market economy. Don't call it outsourcing, instead focus on the root causes like taxation or overregulation or litigation in business, etc. So he gives you a bunch of things to say and he gives a lot of detailed explanations of how politicians have used the wrong words at the wrong time and killed their career because of it, lost elections because of it. Other politicians have used the right word at the right time, and they've resonated with the American people and they've leapfrogged over the competition. So it's an inside look into how politics gets done. And spoiler alert, it's not always positive. Now, I must admit, I felt a little dirty reading the first few chapters of this book because words like ethics and morality come into play. He would argue that what you're doing with these euphemisms is making them more clear, that you're trying to be more clear and more easily understood. I don't necessarily agree with that assessment having read this book, but I do agree that it was very interesting and it's very data-driven. So the title says it all, words that work, things that achieve a desired effect. If you're a politician, it's getting elected. If you're a senator, it's getting support for something you're trying to pass. If you're a corporate leader, it's getting people to rally behind your mission. It's words that achieve a desired effect, which is something that all of us could benefit from. However, there is that little ethical voice that's in my head that says, just because you can sell somebody on something, does it mean that you should? 
just because I can use persuasive language, I can con somebody out of their money or convince them to do something that maybe is against their own best interest, should you? Which is a topic that's not really addressed, if I'm being blunt in this book. It's more like, oh, this is what works, this is what Americans believe. Part of that is nice, part of that is not so nice. So I think you might agree. Now, there's some interesting things here. I circled a few parts here. One is that uh, he talks about politicians who've never been forced to confront the hard choice between conviction and popularity. That sums it all up, right? What you want to say is not necessarily what others hear. Again, he says, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. So it's not necessarily what you believe, it's how other people respond. And in things like popularity contests, that really matters. He also says, before you can create and certainly before you judge, you have to listen to people and respect them for who they are and what they believe. And that's kind of the heart of what polling and all of that is supposed to be about, dial groups, all of that, is about listening to people and saying what actually matters to you and then, in theory, responding to them, although the possibility is wide open for manipulation, obviously. Here, another nice little bit. Credibility is established very simply. Tell people who you are, what you do, then be the person and do what you have said you would do. And finally, remind people that you are what, in fact, you say you are. In a simple sentence, say what you mean and mean what you say. Well, that's a very nice sentiment indeed. I think we can all get behind that. He talks about the profile of the typical American, you know, their education level, what they believe in, what matters to them, which I think a lot of you will understand, but maybe a lot of you haven't necessarily lived. So it's good to be able to connect on that level. Here's another one. Political figures don't have to die a cold, lonely public death thanks to their tongues. The trick is to approach every communication opportunity from the perspective of the audience and always be armed with one really good soundbite. He kind of talks about the way that ideas, and particularly sound bites, they're, they're viral. They can infect language and thought, and in fact, they can steer an entire debate. That's the crazy part. When you call it an inheritance tax, it makes it seem like something that only wealthy people have to deal with. When you call it a death tax, then, oh, suddenly, why am I being taxed upon death? These ideas are infectious, as we have seen. The memification of language, a simple phrase, a soundbite, is so uh, powerful because it infects our language like a virus, like a disease, and it spreads depending on who is using it. So again, it can be weaponized, as we have seen. And in some sense, if you're trying to defeat an opponent, like, say, the Democrats, as he is, then it is the weaponization of language, which, again, is it ethical? I guess you can be the judge of that. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Um, there was one poetic thing. There was a bit of this book that approached poetry about Americans, and I think you might appreciate this, so I, I highlighted it. This is a nice phrase about Americans, I think. Sounds very poetic. We are the descendants of rest restless adventurers who set their sights on strange lands, who, not those placid souls who are content to stay behind. And this holds true whether your ancestors signed the Mayflower Compact, your grandparents were processed at Ellis Island, or whether you snuck across the Mexican border last month. All the cliches are true. We are a nation of pilgrims and pioneers, immigrants and dreamers. America's first immigrant generations came here hoping to found a new Atlantis, a second Jerusalem, a shining city on a hill that would be a light for the entire world. That visionary spirit of exploration animates us still. So if you are looking to get better understanding into how Americans think, into how corporate speak has become what it is in America, how politics has been shaped, this guy has arguably done more to shape politics and political discourse in the last several elections than just about anybody, then this is a must-read to understand what's going on in this crazy country. If you're not from the United States and you think, why do they do what they do? This book will shed a lot of light into why Americans do the good and bad things that they do. So, Dr. Frank Luntz, love him or hate him, it was a book that was very interesting to read. I think you would do well if you're a fan of language to see this book and to read it and to pick it up. So go buy yourself a copy. And again, if Tony Robbins loves it, it's got to be good, right? If you like these kinds of book reviews, if you like expanding your knowledge pool, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. You don't have to smash it. That's not necessary. Just do a gentle tap. Leave a comment. Did you like this book? Do you like Dr. Frank Luntz's work? Let me know, and I hope to hear from you.